Good morning. The context for this talk today is um, that seven people in our Sangha have uh, asked to receive the precepts and it's a tradition uh, in Zen to give the precepts in a um, Bodhisattva initiation ceremony and we'll have that ceremony in October. So it's part of the ceremony is you make um, a small robe like this and then you give it to your teacher and then you get it back with an inscription of a Buddhist name and and uh, lineage papers <coughs> that show um, uh, an so-called unbroken lineage from Shakyamuni Buddha to this day. Now, well, we, this weekend we are uh, gathering with those uh, seven initiates to um, sew this little robe. And it's the little robe because there's a big robe version for people who do full ordination traditionally in Zen practice. But this is a small robe and I'm wearing it today. It's um, it's just practical, you know, <laughs> it's smaller. You can wear it in uh, various occasions. Um, so this is the context, but I, and I want to give a talk about the pr practice with the precepts, um, but I also wanted to open it up for everybody. Because there are some deep questions involved for me. It's like, for example, what is what does meditation have to do with uh, ethical behavior? You know, is meditation helping us to be um, better, <laughs> to do good? I don't know. Anyway, I'll see if I can touch on this. <coughs> or what is good, and you know, what is good? The, the more you look, the less obvious it becomes, really. But uh, just briefly, this ceremony, what does it involve for those who um, have asked to be in it? It's, uh, I think it involves the, a commitment to live in accord with the 16 Bodhisattva precepts. And I'm going to list them later. It's... Um, making vows and a vow is um, a vow is an intention but a vow is an intention that is so strong for you that you give it permission to really change your life <laughs> because we can have all kinds of intentions you know and we do a little bit in the direction of our intention like I sometimes say provocatively you know people want to experience transformation without changing their lives. This is quite common. Like, I include myself. <laughs> I want transformation, but, you know, let's have everything just go on the way it is, just better. <clears throat> anyway, there's some thing that we, some trick that we play in our minds sometimes. So a vow is a commitment to an intention where you actually give that commitment the permission to change your life, maybe, you know, in a quite fundamental way. I mean, that's something to find out what's possible there. And the second, um, the second commitment is a commitment to an embodied path. And what I mean by that is you kind of have to create a real location for your intention to take flight. <laughs> A location to take flight. No, I'm mixing the metaphor. A location to be rooted in, or I don't know, to grow in. Um, anyway, you get my point. Because this this happens quite often that I meet people who say, like, yeah, I've read a lot about Buddhism, and I, 
you know, meditate on my own and I did this and that and I'm... And then there's a point where it's like, for this to be real, like, what do I need? And so the tradition says what you, the ingredients you need is you need a teacher, you need the teaching, and you need a community. Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And if you look for perfection, you know, like finding the perfect teacher, or the perfect community, or the perfect teaching, you, you know, you might never, you might never go do the practice. <laughs> It's a little bit like getting married, you know, if you look for the perfect partner, you might never, you know, have one. So if you uh, start saying, like, I'm going to practice um, marriage with an imperfect partner, you may actually have a marriage and work with, you know, what it means to live and uh, share your life with someone. And it was, I think with it, with Buddhist teaching is a little bit like that too. It's like it's not going to be perfect, but you can make a commitment to um, actual people, you know, a community to practice in. So it seems like the seven people I'm working with right now are wanting to do that. <laughs> Until the ceremony, you can still jump ship. You know? <laughs> And after that, too, but actually, <laughs> you just have to, you just have to live with it then. Um, okay, so, they're the precepts, the 16 Bodhisattva precepts, and uh, I, as I like to say, you know, if you, if you want to really work with the precepts, the first step, the first necessary step is to know the precepts. Um, and I would say to memorize them, to know them so intimately that they can surface in your life. <clears throat> because if they don't surface in your life as you are acting, it's like... It's like they're there, but not really. They're not really there. They, there's like there's no real interaction between the precept and your action. So I've already named the first three as I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, and I take refuge in the Sangha. Refuge doesn't mean like you are going to protect yourself from life in the coziness of Buddhism. Refuge... <laughs> Refuge means um, to commit yourself wholeheartedly to the teaching and rely upon it. You know, Buddhism is not the only path, but it is a, it is a full-fledged unfolding of what it means to uh, lead a spiritual life. And, you know, if we want to be real about it, it's like, let's take this seriously and uh, unfold it i already said you know you could say a refuge in the buddha is you know a commitment to your own awakening and refuge in the dharma is ultimately i would say uh, yes use the teachings but study your own experience so intimately that you can verify the teachings or maybe even evolve them or you know push them further into the truth of what it means to be a human being. This is taking refuge in the Dharma. And taking refuge in the Sangha is to do it with others and to share the fruits of practice with others. And then, then there are the so-called three purifying precepts. And the three purifying precepts are uh, not to do harm, to do good, and to live for the benefit of all beings. And one version I like of this is to refrain from unwholesome action. It's not doing harm. To do wholesome action and to purify the mind. This is another version of this same idea. 
Now, purify the mind, it's like, oh, you have muck in your mind and you got to, like, clean it up. Yeah, there's there, purifying. Why is pu- This is something that I'm pondering actually all the time. Why is purifying the mind sort of in the same place as benefiting all beings? Is the ultimate distortion in our mind is the idea of, of separation, of being fundamentally separate from others. And when we have that impurity, quote, you know, in air quotes, that impurity in our mind, then um, we try to live primarily for our own benefit. <laughs> so to purify the mind in, in terms of releasing the idea of separation from self and other allows us to maybe get a feeling for what it's like to live for the benefit of all beings. Now, it's like, this does not exclude you. What you call you is not excluded from all, you see? It's just like, what is it? what does it mean to release that bias of like, you know, I come first and then the rest, maybe. But again, this is not again. This is this isn't trivial because there's something to study yourself also means to find how deeply biologically, you know, how deeply it is rooted in us biologically to um sur- to want to survive and to be well and take care of ourselves if necessary at the expense of others. And it's not achievable in an absolute way, as we will see with the first precept of not taking the life of other beings. You know, we have to eat. Even if you are vegan, the plants are alive. And we, so, biologically, it is impossible to survive without... Um, taking the life of other beings. <clears throat> okay, but the the main principle is um, not to do harm, and the reverse, to do good. And then, not to do harm is spelled out in the 16 Bodhisattva precepts in the, in the Zen uh, tradition, is spelled out th- through the 10 grave precepts. Uh, I vow not to kill, I support life. I vow not to take what is not given, I practice contentment. I'll, in, I'll interpret these this list a little bit. I vow not, uh, later, I vow not to misuse sexuality. I uh, honor the sacredness of intimacy. <clears throat> I vow not to lie. I manifest truth. I vow um, not to intoxicate body and mind. I maintain clarity. I vow not to denigrate others. <clears throat> I see the suchness in each being. I vow not to elevate the self. I realize the interdependence of self and other. I vow not to be possessive of anything, including the teaching. So that's like material and spiritual generosity. I respond to the generosity, uh, I, I respond generously to the needs of others. I vow not to harbor ill will. I return to kindness. I vow not to abuse the three treasures. I treasure the path of awakening. Okay? So, it's like, if you know this, you can 
live with these ten precepts and they spell out ten ways in which to study what it means to do good and to not do harm. <clears throat> this, um, you know, in a way, this, this principle of not doing harm is kind of obvious to us. And how is it um, how is it tied in with the teaching of Buddhism? I think that the connection that we can see is Buddhism is about liberation from suffering. And practicing not doing harm is ending or at least alleviating suffering. Now those of you who listen to me um, regularly, you know that I use this formula, suffering equals pain times resistance. And when you, when you see that suffering is a product of t pain, unpleasant sensations, and resistance, you see that two paths open up from, from this because you have two factors that produce suffering. If you minimize pain, you minimize suffering. If you minimize the resistance to pain, you also minimize or reduce suffering. So some pain in our life is unavoidable, but if we don't resist it, if, you're, if your resistance is zero in this mathematical formula, even though you have pain, you're not suffering. You're just experiencing pain. So there's a crucial distinction here between pain and suffering. Not all pain turns into suffering. But if you can take pain away, you also that's a good thing because you won't suffer. But if you can take pain away, then the path that is available to you is still to work with your resistance. <clears throat> well, in terms of the precepts, what I find interesting, and this is a kind of, it's not really new to me, but I have, I uh, enjoy exploring it right now. It's like each precept has two sides. It has kind of like an internal side. It has a, has a side that you practice with yourself. It has an external side, is how you practice the precept with others. Now the precept is, is formulated in the way that you are practicing it with others, not to kill. But the internal side of not killing is like, you work with your hatred, and you work with your greed in such a way that you um, end up not being motivated to kill. <laughs> Do you understand? If you hate something, somebody, some situation, we can use killing also in a wider sense of destruction. Right? If you hate something or somebody, you want to get rid of it because it seems like the cause of your suffering. So if you can eliminate it from your experiential sphere, then there's this idea of like, well, then I'm not going to suffer. <clears throat> it's like that which causes my pain if I can get rid of that. But we're turning this around and we're working with our, our resistance, which can, this is a nicer word for hate, um, <laughs> and, our, and our grasping, it's a nicer word for greed, And so if we can accept our experience as it is, not hate it, not greedily hang on to it um, because we resist its, you know, impermanence, its disappearance, we will be less motivated to kill. Actually, it may just fall away. 
you end up sort of just with a necessary amount of killing. This is the idea. No excess in the realm of killing. <clears throat> but externally, when you find in yourself, you find in yourself the ability to reduce your motivation to kill, externally you will commit less killing. And this reduces the pain for other beings. And it reduces the pain for those who are left behind when you, um, you know, when you kill another being, there's always other beings dependent upon that being that are left behind with suffering and with pain, I want to say here more precisely. So we can, now it would be, as a practitioner, it would be your job to put this through all the precepts, this internal and external dimension. It's like, I vow not to take what is not given. I vow not to steal. <clears throat> so it's like, again, it's like, where does stealing come from? It's like, it's this, it's the, it's the experience of not being content with what you have, experiencing lack feeling the right to take a, take something away that is right now in the possession of others. Um, and we can think about what taking what is not given means on, you know, subtler and subtler levels. It can be material, but it can also be to, you know, demand someone's attention that they're not giving freely, or someone's time that they're not <laughs> giving freely, and so forth. This is all can all create relational complications. Um, contentment, you know, I don't just mean this in terms of happiness. I mean it to feel complete. <clears throat> Maybe it should say, feel, I practice completeness. I practice no lack. So this internal dimension would be to actually find out how it is true that we're not lacking anything. But externally, you spare other people the pain of taking things away from them. <laughs> it's like two sides of the same coin. Don't you know, I vow not to misuse sexuality. I, I um, honor the sacredness of intimacy. Is I develop. I continue to, continue to develop the formulations of these precepts. Uh, you know, if you're a member, you can look up the latest version on the membership in the membership portal. <laughs> I'm trying to refine it. You know, it's like there's something about using the formulations to get clear about the spirit. It's not easy to speak about the complexity of what's involved here. But, you know, intimacy for me is this, not just sexual intimacy, but the intimacy with the phenomenal world. It's like there is a... We have a deep need for connection. And our meditative practice can... can bring into the foreground states of mind that you know highlight this intimacy highlight this connect connectedness with with um, the sensorial world with our experience there's such deep satisfaction in that <laughs> it's actually very connected related to this experience of no lack To practice this sacredness of intimacy is like, it really reduces a practice of sexuality that involves objectification and harm. 
I, I think w whenever objectification in the realm of sexuality happens, it's basically, it's because of a lack of intimacy, not in a sexual way or in an erotic way or, you know, with another human being. That is also involved, but fundamentally, a lack of intimacy with the world. It's like, you crave connection so much that you need to use that realm to sort of like, you know, forcibly satisfy it or something which creates uh, great harm. <clears throat> so internally you practice um, intimacy. So that externally you don't have to um, practice it in an unethical way. Or let's take another one. The next one is not to lie and to manifest truth. It's like if we if we think about resistance and grasping, it's like where does lying originate? You know, it's it it originates in not wanting your experience to be the way it is, and then tell a lie about it and deceive others and tell them that it's something else than what it is. Or um, grasp onto your fantasy of how you want the world to be and then present that fantasy as what is the case. It's like when I look at what what is the news now calls the big lie, you know, it's like it may be quite simple. Donald Trump didn't want to accept the, the fact the simple fact that he lost the election. So he told the big lie and dragged the whole country into a deterioration of trust and our electoral system. It's just like, you know. So there's a matter of degree where, you know, lies are being told. Like little lies in like one relationship can already be very destructive, but when these lies are told on, the, on a societal level, they're, they're, they're like, they inflict a lot of pain. <clears throat> because ultimately our living together um, is completely, completely dependent on trust. <clears throat> so, in a way, not lying, which is this external practice of telling other people the truth, is, is very dependent on my ability to live with the facticity of my life and not, you know, go into fantasy or, you know, um, resistance to what is actually happening. That's this internal dimension of working with resistance and grasping. And then it has an external effect. If you protect other people and the social fabric of trust, it requires that inner skill, though, the, the, the courage, the, the wherewithal to, to live with the facts of your own existence. Now, how do we practice this? This is always the most... I mean, we need to understand it in some way. I've tried to just... Um, foster a certain kind of understanding uh, within me, with for you, on behalf of you. But of course, this has this has to become. If you want to practice with this, it has to become a kind of a live process in in you. <clears throat> Maybe we. Maybe it's useful to compare the practice of the precepts with how we enter the zendo. This is one of my favorite topics. Okay, we have a rule. It looks like a rule, but I'm going to question the term rule. Because I want to question the term rule for the practice of the precepts. So we have a rule, seeming, seemingly we have a rule, of how we enter the zendo. And the rule is that you use the foot that is closest to the hinges of the door. 
So in our Zendo, that means you enter with the left foot. And you leave the Zendo with the right foot, because when you leave the door, the hinges are on the right side, and so you use the right foot. <clears throat> and this looks like very formal practice. There's a rule, you, you are told how to do it, and so forth. And when you have a formal rule, you end up doing the right thing or the wrong thing. If you use the right foot to... <laughs> when you use the right foot to enter the zendo, you're using the wrong foot. <laughs> well, it's actually interesting that the rule isn't enter the zendo with the left foot and leave it with the right foot because it's relational. It's actually about the space. It's the foot that's closest to the hinges. It's, so it's, it's, um, it's relational. You have to see what the, um, what the space is like, or we could say it's situational. We could say, enter it with the left foot and leave it with the left foot. You know, but we're saying enter with the enter and leave it with the foot that's closest to the hinges. So it's like you need to have a spatial awareness because in a different room, in a different zendo, it'd be different. Or if you want to take it to any door that you go through, which is an interesting practice to try, um, then you just have to switch, you know, depending on where the hinges are. Buddhist ethics are like that. Buddhist ethics are relational, or relative, and situational. They don't operate with fixed rules. It looks like a fixed rule, just like our prescription for how to enter the Zendo looks like a fixed rule. Now here's the, here's the really interesting part. The purpose of the rule is for you to get your attention in your feet. And the reason for trying to get your attention in your feet is to get your attention in your whole body. So it's like the rule is getting you out of your head and into your feet and via your feet into your whole body. So when you go to practice in the Zendo, the rule forces you to become an embodied person, basically, if you take it seriously and don't say, like, oh, you know, these Zen people have these stupid formalities, they don't apply to me. <clears throat> Which is an okay thing to say or do, but it's just a shallow understanding of what's going on here. <clears throat> When you enter the Zendo with what the rule turns into the wrong foot, okay? So you, you go and you're not quite present and you enter the Zendo with the wrong foot and then you notice it. Then your attention is in your feet and the, and, and the rule has completely served its purpose. This is brilliant. This is really brilliant. When you get that, it's brilliant. Because the deeper purpose of the rule is to bring attention to, 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 the, to the action that you are doing in this very moment. And the precepts are just like that. The purpose of the precepts is to draw attention to what you're doing. So even if you, like, let's take this analogy all the way, even if you violate the precepts, when you're noticing it, you're keeping the precepts. We all violate the precepts. If you, if you think that 
by taking on the precepts, you're going to be this good person who never violates the precepts. Right? Then your then your impetus in practice is is to be a what what's what are the words for this? A do gooder or a goody two shoe or a virtue signaler. When the real work is to investigate what it means to be a human being and live in an ethical dimension in which nobody has clean hands. It's like it is. You can't maintain your life without killing. You can draw the line somewhere. <clears throat> like I heard Alan Watts said, you know, when asked why he was vegetarian, it's because cows cry louder than carrots. <clears throat> but if you can't be healthy without eating meat, you know, then it's actually, then it means like I have to accept that I have to do the killing in that animal realm and not just in the plant realm. But it's still, you know, it's a matter of degree, but it's still killing. Like you can't have clean hands. There's no way to absolutely follow the precepts of not killing, the rule. But you can use the precept to observe your actions. And notice what it does to you when you're engaging in unnecessary killing. Or what it does to the relational fabric. And the same for uh, all the other precepts. Which is, again, this is, as a practitioner, this is your job to spell this out for yourself. I brought this uh, book because there's a little section here, Suzuki Roshi saying in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, the point, he's making the point that I'm trying to make um, in my own way. Even though it seems as if you are violating the precepts, he says, you are actually observing them in their true sense. In short, when you do everything, no, the point is whether you have big mind or small mind. In short, when you do everything without thinking about whether it is good or bad, and when you do something with your whole body and mind, then this is our way. This can be very easily misunderstood. Do you see that? It's very easy to misunderstand. Because it presents, on the surface, it presents Zen as an amoral teaching. It's like, even though it seems you're violating the precepts, you're actually observing them. Ah, okay. It doesn't really matter, right? The point is whether you have big mind or small mind. And then you can just you can just bullshit yourself. You can just say like, well, I'm violating precepts, but I'm doing it with a big mind. <laughs> In short, when you do everything without thinking about whether it's good or bad, oh, I don't have to think about good and bad at all. It's unnecessary. I just have to, you know, um, do it with my whole body and mind. So if I do the killing mindfully, it's fine. <laughs> Zen has been construed this way. This has happened historically. Japanese Zen Buddhists have instrumentalized the teaching for Japanese imperialism and uh, militarism. This is, you can read books about it. This has happened. It's like, if you have a view of no self, then it's like, well, if I have a sword and I use it, the contemporary philosopher Slavoj Žižek, he's always criticizing Buddhism in this way. It's like, oh, you know, you hold a sword and you uh, 
kill somebody. If you have a view of self, then you're saying, like, I'm killing you, you know, that's a bad thing. And if you have a view of no self, it's like, oh, the 10,000 things came together in a way where you fell onto my sword. <clears throat> and it's not even my sword. This is a serious criticism of, of Zen Buddhist philosophy, and it's not trivial. It's like we should be aware of this. But it's different. When Suzuki Roshi says is like when you don't consider good and bad, but do it with your whole body and mind instead. It's like if you come into your activity with the idea that you're going to be a good person, you've already lost your way. Because you can't be absolutely good. It's a delusion. When you do things with your whole body and mind, you are, without any conceptual overlay, you are exposing yourself to what is really happening in that moment. And we have to find out whether what Buddhist ethics is founded on is actually the case for us. When you are this intimate with this, through a practice of bodyfulness, a whole body-mind presence, when you are this intimate with your actions, do you find in yourself spontaneously a lack of wanting to kill, a lack of wanting to lie, a lack of wanting to put yourself above others? You know, is this really the case? Buddhist ethical teachings say, yes, this is possible for a human being to be that intimate with the world that, this, that the precepts basically hold themselves spontaneously. <clears throat> in the complexity of life, actually. In the complexity. It, that's the complexity of, I can't survive without killing. I can't, it's actually impossible to say the full truth, because whatever you say conceptually will always fall short of the complexity of your real life. <clears throat> but you do your best. You don't intentionally deceive people with lies. So, to, to, this, to this last point then, you know, is there a connection between our practice of meditation and ethical conduct? Because the criticism is that you that Buddhism has this dangerous possibility of um, producing enlightened assholes. It has happened. It's like if you look into the Buddhist world of scandals, you know, that's basically, this is why people are um, disenchanted with, you know, the nice words of, you know, of Buddhist teachings or spiritual teachings in general, because underneath it, you know, these seemingly enlightened people are acting like assholes. Now, I think there's always more complexity than what you read in the news. There's always, things are always more, you know, complicated. But, still, bad things have happened in Buddhist Sangha. So you have to ask the question, is like, what, where is this effect, where is this connection between so much meditative effort and not doing harm and doing good? So it's a legitimate question, yeah? not just for others. Mostly, I think, it should be a question for ourselves. 
And to find out our own limitations, but also our own aspiration of like what 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 it is that actually can like what kind of transformation can happen, and then commit ourselves to that path. So my time is limited now, so I want need to wrap this up. What is the experience of intimacy that meditation can facilitate or support? For me, it's something like I notice that all of you, and that means actually all phenomena, the whole web of life, if you want to go big, the entire universe. <laughs> Appears within my own mind, and you can bracket own, you know, it appears within this mysterious realm of awareness that, um, that is existence. But it's very difficult for us to shed the language of self and others. So I'm going to use it and say, like, all of you appear within my mind. And by inference, I know that I appear within your mind. <clears throat> the mind is not, like, there's separation and the mind is inside and it's really hard to get to the world. <laughs> it's like, the whole world appears within me and the whole world appears within you from different perspectives. And we are, um, we are intimate in this way. This, all of you appear within me and I appear within you, and you know, anyway, you, you get the point, is this mutual space and intimacy that is the reality of our existence at every moment we can become very forgetful of that and be identified with our thoughts and feel like we're living behind our ears and behind our eyes and between our ears you know very separated from from the phenomenal world <clears throat> and meditation is a, is a process to um could say, awaken to that fact. Really, you know, step out of that forgetfulness. Well, my experience is when I when I'm in that place, I already want to stop unnecessary killing. I already want to not tell lies or misuse sexuality or make myself more important than other people, or put others down, or hold things back, you know, so that others can't have them. This, it seems silly to me to live this way. When I feel the intimacy, it's, 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 it doesn't make sense. But when, the, when, the, when that intimacy uh, disappears, and I experience myself as a separate self that is in danger and needs to take care of himself and, you know, has strong feelings of security, then, you know, yeah, then I get into this realm of serving first and foremost myself. We need to respect that too. When it comes to kind of our biological and psychological survival, I think we need self-compassion to realize, oh, then, then we re-enter this whole realm of self-centeredness. I think this is also where, uh, and then I'll close, where a social dimension opens up, where it's like these subtle levels of treating each, ourselves, each other well, you know, are dependent on on lifting people into a realm where they're not fighting for their survival. I don't think we can expect to live in a just 
uh, ethical shared world if we maintain economic and political systems that push people into poverty. Because when you fight for survival, it's so deeply wired into our biology that we first have to take care of ourselves and our family that it's like unrealistic to have any kinds of expectations of this of a flourishing of this kind of Buddhist ethic that I just presented. The Buddha knew this, that it's important that material a certain material standard of living is the prerequisite <clears throat> for spiritual practice. I don't think it has to be, you know, I don't think we all have to be rich. <laughs> it's just a modest standard of living that ha doesn't have us fight for survival every uh, minute of our life is, um, is uh, maybe enough. What enough is is something we can find out in a process. But you see what I'm saying? This, is all, this has to also be part of our ethical understanding of practicing these precepts. <clears throat> so don't look for perfection in yourself. Don't, don't say, like, the precepts are about turning myself into this good, maybe even perfect being. But also, don't use that as, you know, some excuse for complacency. It's about, like, using your feet when you go through doors. It's like, can you bring the precepts effectively to your everyday actions so that you observe, you know, through, they, they're like, this is transforming the precepts into a probe instead of a rule. <laughs> the probe is like an instrument that you send somewhere so that you can see better, right? But it's also an investigation. It's like you investigate your own aliveness, your own existence, to find out whether something like, I call this, in my own mind, maybe it can be actually a term that, that makes sense to you too, I call this spontaneous renunciation. I'm not cutting things off because someone's telling me not to do something or that it's bad. Spontaneous renunciation is to find out that my aliveness isn't supported if I continue doing certain kinds of action. <clears throat> it just falls away spontaneously because it doesn't it doesn't support me. And it doesn't support me in this wider sense of an inter a connection through intimacy. So we have to be also patient for this. If we want authentic ethical contact, conduct and not, you know, just coerce people into pretending that they're good, which is most what most religions have done, we kind of have to wait for this maybe, you know, delicate, maybe unlikely process of spontaneous renunciation to take place in us. <clears throat> and, and keep watching over it with the precepts understood more as a probe than as a rule, set of rules. Thank you very much.